Dennis Tekrick, co-founder of Portia Technologies, reveals ways hotels are able to create great guest experience for the luxury travelers and why personalization has become an overused word. Next, on Hotel Tech Talk. You know I love it when I river down. It's raining on me, on me, on me, on me. So Dennis, uh, welcome to our episode. And uh, it's great to connect with you. We had a chance to have a chat not too long ago. And because I had an ch- opportunity to see your uh, services uh, through a friend of mine's LinkedIn uh, account and I thought that that is a we should have a discussion and uh, um, so uh, let's start with uh, the first uh, thing I'm interested in and all our raw viewers are interested uh, Dennis tell about yourself and of course give us a in in a sort of introduction of what you are doing perfect thanks Sam Eric uh, nice talking to you again um, so as you alluded here to, I'm Dennis Tekrek. I'm one of two co-founders at a company called Portier Technologies. Um, and what we essentially do is we focus on the guest, guest services and guest experience element of any hotel stay. And we do this by providing customized smartphones, placing them in hotel rooms and enabling the hotel to both access the guest and understand the guest behavior. And at the same time, allow the guests to access all of the hotel's offerings as well as being able to stay connected across the state, whether that's at the hotel or away from the hotel. Very good. And how, how did you come up with this idea? Because there has been a number of services already available for some time. And uh, uh, how, did you, how did you see the opportunity to enter with this particular service? Um, I think the opportunity essentially came from uh, the way in which we felt that some hotels struggled to really put their name on the map uh, when it comes to guest experience in particular. And we felt that we could create an environment and, and, and a solution and a platform that would enable the hotels to actually amplify their guest services without having to replace any staff members. So essentially enabling the staff members to um, access our platform for the benefit of the hotel and to um, and to you know to come up with better ways of servicing their guests um, the way the way we specifically thought about this was that we looked at a number of ways in which hotels try to engage their guests and we found that applications and in-room tablets in particular were two solutions that just didn't offer enough engagement levels so we came up with a solution whereby we wrapped an application around a physical phone Uh, and made the barrier to entry for each guest staying at the hotel so low that there wasn't any requirement from the guest side to get onto this platform. And that was basically the driving factor behind what we wanted to do. And uh, the premise on which this whole thing is built is that we felt hotels needed a better way to first amplify their ancillary services to make them available and to better sell those services to guests And at the same time, to keep up with the pace at which guest services across the hospitality sector has been developing. And, you know, that's that's uh, the the backbone of what we do. The backbone is essentially to um, to provide a platform, to provide a solution that enables hotels to do exactly that without having to put too much effort into it. Yeah. What is sort of the the, the winning feature in your uh, service that the customer loves most? Um, I think it depends on the type of customer. A lot of uh, guests like, I mean, there's there's a large set of guests, for instance, that travel from the West to Asia, for example. Uh, we find that those guests are mostly interested in the communications and uh, connectivity element of it. So they love the fact that they can be exploring a city as confusing as Bangkok and that they have the ability to, uh, via a chat feature that we have, always stay connected to the hotel's concierge or the staff members. Um, what we also find with a lot of Western guests is that they love the idea of simply being connected. Um, so our devices, for instance, offer hotspot availability at all times. So when they go to a coffee shop uh, or when they go and explore the city, they don't actually physically have to ask anybody for Wi-Fi passwords or anything along those lines. They simply stay connected to our devices. So it's this level of simplicity and it's this seamless connectivity that seems to be uh, a big, big winner for, for guests. 
So, okay, so if I'm in Bangkok, and you're right, it can be a little bit confusing uh, and when you can get lost. I got your uh, the phone or device with me, and then I'm, I'm sort of getting lost. Uh, but I have, I have a, some sort of a button where I can just connect with uh, uh, my friendly concierge at the, or the staff at the hotel, and they can... Uh, and I, 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 they can help me out, or how does it work in practicality? Yes. Yeah. You, so you basically have a very uninterrupted channel between yourself and the guest. Uh, sorry, and the uh, and the hotel staff member. Uh, for some hotels, that's the concierge. Other hotels prefer to uh, use the front desk uh, yeah. staff members for this particular yeah. service. And the idea is that if you are lost, for example, or if you are looking for recommendations, you just press one button that takes you straight to a chat conversation with that staff member. And you can either share your location, you can type in a text, and you can type this text in in your language, actually. And uh, you would then get recommendations from the uh, staff member. But this is also, in many ways, this is also a security feature. Say in a city like Bangkok, you have uh, events that might be political, for example, and you, um, you might have ended up in an area that's incredibly busy on a certain day, and you might feel a bit unsafe or you yeah. might feel a bit lost. That's also, uh, you know, that button essentially also takes you to uh, not just recommendations, but it also helps you navigate confusion a bit better. So in practicality, um, you just tap, tap that button, start chatting, and the guest services member will immediately get your messages. And if that particular guest services member is, uh, is currently busy, it gets escalated to somebody else until somebody actually responds to your request. And um, you know you get dealt with very very quickly, and you don't have this inconvenience of maybe pay making a phone call, which is something that you can do as well. Yeah. But you don't have this inconvenience yeah. of you know trying to work out local accents or uh, finding it maybe maybe you're a bit shy and you don't want to actually have a phone conversation. So the chat feature in particular keeps you connected without uh, without a high barrier to entry. What is the most common reason you have found that uh, certain hotels doesn't believe this is the, the best thing and uh, why are they reluctant to buy into these kind of services? Um, I think sometimes uh, hotels have a um, hotels have a somewhat uh, I don't want to say negative but a somewhat slightly apprehensive view towards technology in that they think that technology might lead to uh, one of two things, either for staff members to be replaced and to be deemed unnecessary or superfluous from because of the introduction of technology. And on the other hand, um, often technology seems as though there's going to be a huge change required within the hotel organization. Um, I think those are two specific reasons as to why a lot of hoteliers have felt, I, I don't want to say a lot, I mean, it, it doesn't happen too much. But as and when it happens, uh, I think uh, those hoteliers that we then, um, you know, have a bit of backlash from or have a bit of a, a negative view from, they feel that either this is going to create a lot of work or that this is going to um, make the, you know, make the staff members less important than they were before. And I think that's an area that uh, we typically address by by making each partner that we work with understand that we never, never see ourselves as a replacement to anything, but as an enhancement to staff members. We actually really buy into this idea of, um, you know, the romantic side of hotels, if you like. Uh, we buy into this idea of uh, hoteliers going to hotel schools, be that Cornell, La Roche, or any of the uh, Swiss hotel schools, for instance. And we love the idea that they are the best educated when it comes to servicing people. So we feel that we just want to give them an additional weapon to even better put their service on display rather than saying this is going to replace you or this is going to, uh, you know, this is going to uh, create an environment whereby you are no longer be, you, you, are, you will no longer be deemed necessary. So that's definitely something we try to go against. And once we go past that uh, period or once we go past that barrier uh, of explaining what we actually do, um, a lot of hotel hoteliers, even the older school hoteliers, if you like, they uh, find that they can buy into this. Yeah. Now, where does the, when it comes to, I mean, I, I had talked to a couple of hotels and uh, where they were, uh, there are some different services where there are tablet services and so on. And the first uh, 
uh, objection I heard that, oh, but if the customer is stealing that tablet, that was a, the, the thing that we're most worried about. What would be sort of, uh, because this is a, uh, invested by the hotel, this device that you're providing in the room. Am I correct? Um, so we charge a subscription fee. So that okay. means that they don't actually have to purchase the devices. Okay. So that in itself becomes less of a worry. Um, but also, um, you know, if if you, yes, it is an argument. It is an argument that you, uh, that you can make. Um, but at the end of the day, I think... Um, we specifically operate in the luxury segment. Yes. And if you look at the luxury segment, you, you know, if as a luxury hotelier, you want to provide the best possible service out there. So if your limitation comes in at the stage where you think somebody might steal this, then you might say the same things about towels, for instance. Yes. You might say, why should I buy more high-end towels if people are going to steal these towels? So rather than spending X amount on towels, I'm going to spend Y amount on towels. And then uh, it might put me in a worse position than my competitor who decided to think that they can fully trust their guests. And I think that's um, that's just a general argument. Having said that, we have a lot of mechanisms where, where we can track the devices, where we can make them unusable. Um, but up until now, our loss rate has been below 1%. Mm -hmm. And most of those losses or damages have always been accidental. So we haven't we haven't yet had a case in over two years where somebody actually physically took a phone uh, with the idea of wanting to use the phone for other purposes. Yeah. I mean, plus, I mean, people, are, everybody has their own phone anyway. This is just an additional uh, uh, op option for them now when they're staying, uh, staying at the hotel. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's almost like a vacation phone. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you, you have uh, educated a lot already, and, uh, but now I'm interested to look into the future with you and... Uh, how do you see the services uh, uh, not improving, but what, what is sort of what is how do you see the future within the the services you are providing and within the hotel industry? Uh, okay, that's that's it's a very interesting question. I think um, there is a, there is a few different viewpoints on this. From my personal perspective, um, what I what I have seen is that a lot of these uh, very technology focused services that don't have an affiliation to the hospitality sector, they are becoming more and more crowded. So if we think back three, four, five years ago, uh, how important it became to have a marketing strategy for Instagram as a hotel, how important it was to have a marketing strategy for even things like Snapchat as a hotel. Uh, and now, you know, I've personally seen how those services are somewhat fading out because they are designed for the masses. Yes. And I think making a distinction between one hotel and the other hotel uh, will always be tougher on platforms that are not hospitality centric. It will be tougher on platforms that are technology focused and don't necessarily integrate into the conversation the hotelier themselves. So what I see, I think, uh, in respect to our service in particular, is that there's going to be closer and closer collaboration with hotels from our side. And we're going to get to a level where... Uh, we will, you know, the product and the features will develop in a way that will essentially look at it from a hotel's perspective and almost as though we would be pairing up with the minds of the hotel managers, for instance, who say things like, I wish this could be done via technology. And I think that's, that's an area, that's a viewpoint that we take whereby we say, instead of the technology leading, let the hospitality side of things lead because when it comes to technology, we have elements in there that are, you know, AI powered, for instance, but it's not something that we want to put out there and say, hey, we're an AI company just right. for the sake of being uh, cutting edge technology. Right. I think it's very, very important that you marry uh, what your technology does to what your technology needs to do. And I think that's the, that's the sort of dynamics that I see going forward, whereby the hotels, once they get a bit more involved, they will be able to sort of dictate uh, or at least design the way in which technology should be built. Okay, that's very, very good point of views. Um, <clears throat> uh, now, <clears throat> I'm just taking, uh, thinking of, uh, let's say I stayed in uh, uh, one, one of the hotels that has your, uh, has your, those services that you're providing. And uh, I, I'm a strong believer in personalization of, of uh, for the guest. And uh, usually the first time 
uh, you are getting to know each other a little bit better. And in fact, uh, this device might be, and the service might be a, a great way to see what are your things that you enjoy doing and, and so on. How about uh, for, the, for the future, if I'm come again, uh, will the hotel possibly have some of my uh, things I like, my likes and dislikes that then I can better personalize the visit for, for me for the next time? Meaning tracking the information yeah, so that you're, that is how it's being used uh, during my stay. Yeah, so we are working on, we are working on additionally providing a bit more personalization. But I think one caveat on personalization is that um, uh, at least from our point of view, personalization at scale can be a bit daunting. So, um, you know, personalization has, a, has been a word that's been incredibly overused. <laughs> so I send a marketing campaign on email, for instance, and I can say, personalize and the level of personalization means I send an email to 2000 people and the one bit of personalization it does it says hi Sam Eric <laughs> instead of saying hi uh, subscriber yes so okay. you know there's a I think there's a differentiation between genuine personalization and uh, personalization at scale yeah so essentially no matter what we do no matter how we collect this data and we do collect this data and we we try to feed it back to hotels on a weekly basis, even today, but we try to do it in a way that can be actionable by the hotel. Because if you have a hotelier that says, I'm going to leave a handwritten note to one of my guests, and I'm actually going to make it very personal, that hotelier already has the has all the rights, uh, you know, has a completely correct attitude towards servicing a guest. So if you have that attitude towards servicing a guest, our service will come in and will say, guess what? You know, your guests or this particular guest that you le left this uh, note to, they typically enjoy doing these types of things. And during their last day, they, they did these things. So you can adjust your service next time. But, you know, doing this at a scale, at a, at a, at a, at a very high scale where, you know, you see a hundred room hotel and they might be, they might have something like four five thousand visit four th 5,000 visitors a year. It's very, very hard to, from, from a technology perspective, to provide genuine personalization for those four to five thousand. Thank you. So, you know, it's it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act where, where we think the power still lies with the hotel staff members. Um, we just give them the tools and the tools that feed into this, for instance, are the chat feature. They are we have a push messaging feature, for instance, that allows hoteliers to, you know, if, if you have a wine connoisseur, for instance, that's staying at your hotel, the feature allows you to specifically send specific bottles of wines to that particular person using a push message, for instance, saying, hey, I have a collection here of wines that are very, very specific, and I do know that you're a connoisseur. Uh, you know, as long as you maintain the essence of uh, being a hotelier, I think our personalization can work well. If you don't have that in the first place, I don't think we will ever be a replacement, nor will anything else be. So, Dennis, this has been a very interesting uh... Uh, conversation and uh, I really love the way your 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 approach is to the personalization and also how to uh, improve the customer service uh, on, a, on on a very distinct level utilizing sort of this technology. But uh, now I'm a little bit more interested about you because I've seen that you are writing interesting blogs and you travel extensively uh, in, in in Asia. So um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, Gourmet food or street food? Um, I think I think I'm more of a street food person. Uh, Bangkok, Jakarta, um, you know, Chiang Mai, uh, even Hong Kong. Those places just offer so much street food that uh, the the quality and the the you basically get the essence of the culture. So I would have to say street food. I totally agree with you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a street food fan myself and. Uh, I love to roam on the back alleys and uh, find that uh, 30 baht uh, noodle, which I have to stand in line long or uh, a long time just to get in there. And so I, I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, do you, do you eat ice cream, by the way? Uh, yeah, every now and then. And I think being in Asia, uh, I think I'm getting more into coconut ice cream. Okay. So I like the idea of fresh, fresh coconut ice cream. I think that's something with... I think when I was growing up in Europe, obviously vanilla was a big thing, yes. and I think that's that is probably one of the more common flavors, and maybe something like pistachio uh, yes. when it, when you look at Italian gelato. Yes. But uh, nowadays, I think I'm getting more into coconut ice cream. 
Uh, how about durian ice cream? Nope. nope. <laughs> durian is. Uh, I think durian is very similar to uh, you know to it's essentially you either like it or you hate it. Yes. Uh, and I think I happen to be on the side that I don't really like it, so I try to avoid durian um, <laughs> as much as I can. Yeah, I mean, I, I lived in Jakarta, so I, I, I once in a while went to the one one street where they were selling along the. Uh, road uh, these durians and it was a uh, uh, I have to admit I had a little bit of a tough time to get the, or b beyond the the the, the very strong uh, uh, scent so and but uh, I agree with you I mean uh, in Jakarta particularly I learned to enjoy the the fresh coconut ice cream with sort of then the fresh coconut slices in there that's really one of my yeah, favorites yeah. and then yeah mangosteen of course is another one which is quite nice if it's very well made Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what uh, what sound or noise do you love? Um, okay, so do you know this? I think it's called the erhu, which is a which is a Chinese instrument, um, almost a mix of a. Uh, it's it's a bit like a um, it's a bit like a violin, like a Chinese violin. I think it's referred to as well. Um, I just love the sound of that. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of classical Chinese pieces I listen to, but um, also in, in, in Hong Kong or in Shanghai, you often come across uh, street musicians that play the instrument and then they put a twist on by using um, some of the more Western uh, Western tunes that we are accustomed to. Uh, I, I just love that sound. So yeah, Erhu, I think, is, uh, is, is an absolutely beautiful instrument to listen to. Very good, very good. Well, I think uh, one has to go to YouTube and maybe do a search and then for the, if you haven't seen that before, Then I, for the viewers, I think uh, that's a good uh, good tip for get sort of that uh, uh, flair of uh, Chinese uh, instrument. And I also like the idea of uh, how the, some of the musicians are uh, taking this. Uh, they, they have they have a classic background, but then they are taking their they take their generation feel on on what's what, what the music they're listening to, which can be cross the cross cultural, and then they integrate that into how they are playing that uh, that instrument so i love that too uh, so where do you hang Very out good. on social media dennis where is it, where is your favorite hangout well, I, i i think i've sort of it's lost its appeal to me uh, especially i think over the last two years if anything i think i like uh, linkedin a lot more than anything else because linkedin is a bit more if we class linkedin as a traditional social media platform which it necessarily isn't but um I think LinkedIn is good because there's a lot of good information still being shared between people, uh, and you get to uh, you get to find out about things that might be relevant to your industry or to um, to your work um, that are actually valuable. Um, before this, I think Instagram was always quite good because it 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 had this thing of saying, okay, it's just going to be photos and it's going to be an uh, in, in, in insight into certain locations, for instance, but. Now, if you look at the amount of uh, crowdedness that you come across, it's not as appealing as it used to be. But I'd say LinkedIn and Instagram are still sort of my two uh, two favorite go-tos when it comes to social media. Yeah, I'm there also, and and uh, I think I'm I'm beyond sort of some of the traditional platforms myself. And I've been in LinkedIn for a long time, yeah. but now I see the opportunity to to learn more and also to contribute and and. Uh, build community there uh, which i enjoy very much on linkedin and uh yeah yeah, yeah. instagram also i think the the features that instagram is now providing that uh, you can do a uh, long form video on the igtv and uh, i found that it's quite you can get quite a bit of traction there which i found very very, very interesting so yeah I, i'm there too yeah. i'm there there too with you so um, very good. <laughs> uh, tell me something that is true that almost nobody agree with you on Um, I think that's a tough one to answer because uh, I it's never a curveball they call it in, in baseball. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think for me it's it's a, like I, we've you know in my time I've seen so many things that I didn't expect, so it's sometimes a bit hard to um, categorically say this is right or this is wrong. Um, maybe one of the things that speci that's specific to my industry um, because we're a startup, we also often talk to investors. Uh, and we talk to people who are not directly affiliated with the hospitality or hotel industry. Um, and in that sense, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't believe me is that 
there's an overflow of technology going into the hotel industry that's going to lose its relevance completely in a few years to come. So when I talk about robots, for instance, hotel robots, and at times how useless they are in comparison to a um, you know to a traditional staff member, uh, I think that's an area where I face a lot of uh, backlash, I guess, but not not from people from the industry, but from people from outside the industry yes. because. The logic would be, why would you not want to have a robot? Because everything is going to become a bit more efficient. But then, you know, at the hotel level, you talk to somebody and they say, yeah, you know, the robot can't even climb up the stairs. Um, you know, so you, it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a strange one. But I think uh, generally, uh, what what I find true is that less can be more, especially in the hotel industry at the crossroads of hotels and technology. And I think that's something that not many people that are external to the industry buy into. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 these are, that's a very interesting to topic and it's actually a whole uh, episode that's on its own about uh, robotics and artificial intelligence and machine learning and etc. I think uh, from, from, from where I see it is that, uh, uh, that uh, it would be less visible, the, the artificial intelligence sort of in, it's in the back, but it is there to support uh, sp support your customer service and, and the personalization of your stay and rather than uh, rather than the, the how people see uh, robotics as the sort of the tin man walking yeah. uh, trying to get up the stairs it doesn't uh, I, I totally agree with you yeah yeah, yeah I, I think yeah that's a good point I think there's a lot of hidden development that that's not visible to the eye yeah that's uh, often a lot relevant yeah yeah absolutely yeah one of the things I uh, just sort of uh, want to share with you, uh, in, in Finland, there is a course that has been offered by uh, through the, one of the universities, which is free of charge. It's about the introduction to artificial intelligence. And it turns out to be so popular that it, uh, there's about 140,000 subscri subscribers that are taking the course just to understand uh, uh, the data science, computer science, uh, because when you're asking a person what what is the definition of artificial intelligence, it's even not so easy thing to answer because it actually is is changing. So you know usually yeah. the, the the computer nerd says that the, anything that the, that the human cannot uh, cannot uh, create uh, on, on technology is uh, artificial in artificial intelligence. That's what they are saying. But there are so many definitions. But uh, so I decided to take that course because I I, uh, I consider myself uh, a forever learner and I am curious about what's happening and yeah. and uh, by taking this course I I, I'm, I know a little bit more so I can have a little bit of a, a discussion and, and maybe a counter argument for people who don't think it's an important thing to have. Oh no, uh, I, no I think that's a good point and I think that's a good good route to take with uh, just an interesting viewpoint from this side of the of the world. I think when I mean I spent a lot of time in in mainland China, for instance, and uh, the the conversation around artificial intelligence there has ebbed out so much that artificial intelligence is no longer seen as this buzzwordy thing. It's actually a feature. So it means that you know if your if your product or if your service doesn't have artificial intelligence related features, which you know even we have a lot of, uh, you're you're not competitive enough in the field out there and. Um, the, the the flip side of that is that there's this danger of people buying into it too much that they've you know pushed themselves as artificial intelligence um, you know saying something like we are an artificial intelligence company to me still sounds a bit strange because from my angle it's artificial intelligence is just a collection of features but for somebody else it's actually a whole company so that part is a bit questionable I'd say from at least from the Asian perspective. 